Today is the day that we rejoice for the ultimate blessed reality that Christ arose from the grave. Welcome back everybody to our Easter Tide Bible study series. I pray that you have been having a blessed week, that you have enjoyed our time of meditating on the resurrection together. We're going to continue our study today on the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our lives. Because we don't want the resurrection of Christ just to be ethereal theology that we say. But we want to understand what it really means for our lives and also for the world around us so that we can proclaim the good news of the resurrection to ourselves and to the world around us. All right, so pray with me as we begin our study for today. Gracious God, thank you for another opportunity to get into your word together. Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity to study freely in this context. Lord, we pray for brothers and sisters around the world who do not have this privilege. Lord, that they will be encouraged by the good news of your resurrection and that we will be advocates for them. Holy Spirit, be with us today as we study. Open up our hearts and open up our minds to understand the good news that you have entrusted us with. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, as a recap, we've been talking about the significance of Christ's resurrection for our lives. What we said last week was that the earliest church, that is, the church within the period uh, in which the New Testament was written, understood the resurrection of Christ to be an important encouragement to their sense of daily hope and encouragement as Christians in this world in general. And so we wanted to get that hope and that understanding for ourselves, because in our culture, the resurrection of Christ can be rather ethereal and just something that we're used to saying, but not really understanding what it means for our lives. So we want to get the hope and encouragement and sense of awe and wonder and joy that they had about the resurrection for ourselves. So last week we traveled all the way to Greece and we entered into the world of first century Thessaloniki, where we saw the Thessalonian Christians, that is, those who Apostle Paul is writing to in the epistles of first and second Thessalonians. They're really small epistles in the Bible. If you flip too quickly, you'll pass right by them. But last week we dove into their world. And as we said, this was a new church plant. It was essentially a baby church and they were baby Christians. They were young in their faith and addition, additionally to being young in their faith, they were also being persecuted for their faith. Some people, as the letter tells us, had even died within their congregation. But as you can imagine, they were experiencing a, a season of sorrow because of all of this. And what Apostle Paul encourages the struggling baby church, how he encourages them is counterintuitive to the way that many of us would encourage brothers and sisters who are struggling or mourning. When we see brothers and sisters mourning or in sorrow, sorrow in our context, how do we encourage them? How do you encourage people who you see who are struggling and are in mourning? We typically encourage them through prayer. We'll say, I'm praying for you. The church is praying for you. This is a good thing, but it's not what Apostle Paul does to encourage this church. We may encourage people that we see who are mourning, who are experiencing seasons of sorrow by giving them our presence, giving them our resources, which are good things to do. They are important things to do, but again, it's not how the Apostle Paul encourages the Thessalonian church. When he's encouraging this church in Thessaloniki, these brothers and sisters in Christ, 
that were in mourning and sorrow, he anchors them in a central hope of the New Testament and a central hope that the earliest Christians held near and dear, which was the resurrection of Jesus. He anchors them in the resurrection and what it means for their lives and also for our lives. So we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse thir beginning at verse 13, to see just how Paul encouraged them. This text says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, i.e. resurrected, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's a whole lot. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So what is Paul saying with all of this? Essentially, he's saying, be encouraged, you suffering and mourning church. Be encouraged and remember what the resurrection of Jesus, what his resurrection means for your life. That's the way that he encourages them. And we went through that last week. So if you want to dive into that a little bit more, go back to last week's Bible study. But I just want to point out that this is the way that he encourages this persecuted, mourning, and sorrowful church. That he anchors them in the resurrection and what the resurrection of Christ means for their lives. Let me draw your attention to verse 14. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring it with him those who have died. Because Jesus died and rose again, i.e., because Christ resurrected from the grave, those of us who are in Christ, Paul is saying, can expect God to give us a resurrection like Christ. And this was an encouragement to the Thessalonians because, as we explained last week, the resurrection of Christ was and is tied to God's plan to renew the world and to renew us. The resurrection of Christ, just in case you missed it, is very much tied to God's plan, his promise to renew the world and to renew us. So this is what I want to dig into a little bit more today. This connection between the resurrection of Christ and God's plan to renew all things. Because when we understand this, this helps us to see more clearly what the resurrection means as far as significance for our lives. All right, so let's explore this. Let's explore this connection that scripture makes between the resurrection of Christ and God's promise to renew all things. All right, so we're gonna go on a ride together. And all I'm asking is that you stay in the car, don't get out, just keep going on the ride. And we're gonna see how these things are connected. The first place we're gonna stop here is the, New, is the Old Testament. The Old Testament. All right, so the climax of the Old Testament, the climax of hope that we find in the Old Testament is God looking down at a world that is not fulfilling his original purpose. That, that is, the world is full of corruption, violence, and all manner of sinful outcomes and productions because of human beings, because of what we're doing in the world. God is looking down and seeing those who are suffering because of sin and all of the death and heartache that is bringing into his world that he originally intended to be good and flourishing and blessed. 
the climax of God's promises in the Old Testament is that God looking down at this promise looking down at this problem promises to renew all things to bring it back into alignment that is to bring his world and humanity back into alignment to to the intent in which he created the world and the intent to which he created us that is God promises to make a world where everything is set right where there is no more suffering no more corruption that all the things that are a product of sin are excised from his world and one of the places that we can see this promise that God makes the clearest is in Isaiah 65 Isaiah 65 17 we see God saying this he says see I will create new heavens and a new earth the former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind now why does God have to do this why does God have to create a new heavens and a new earth why does God have to renew all things it's important for us to see the why God is doing this the why behind God is doing this so that we can see the significance that lies behind the resurrection so we're going to go just on a very short crash course through the Old Testament and it explains why God is making this promise so let's start here in Genesis because God created a good world he created and he saw all that he created as good this is the repeated phrase that we see in the creation narratives in, in Genesis chapter 1 God creates and God saw that it was good we even see in verse 31 a summary of everything that God created and how God feels about it it says in Genesis 1 31 God saw everything that he made and indeed it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day so God creates this beautiful good world then enters who us enters the first human beings or the archetypal humans and as the narrative continues to unfold in in the opening chapters of Genesis what we see is that human beings placed in God's good world choose to walk on a path of rebellion against God and from there the story goes downhill and we continue as we continue through Genesis what we see enter into the world through humanity's choice to rebel against God is we see violence enter we see polygamy enter we see oppression enter as Genesis 3 continues on through the rest of the Bible what we see is a flowering of sin what we see is the fruit of sin which is a whole lot of bad things besides violence polygamy oppression a lot of things that God never intended for to be in his world enters his world and it causes pain and suffering in other words we begin to see the effects of sin in the world yet what we also see in Genesis is God on the journey of trying to redeem humanity who has lost its way and bring them back to the good intentions that he had for them that he had for us in the climax of Genesis is God promising to bless the world through a certain someone and I think you know that someone Abraham father Abraham so God promises that he's going to bless the world through Abraham and his seed Genesis 22 18 says in and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me so God sees humanity falling off the rails from Genesis 3 forward and God begins to put a plan into motion to bring humanity back to the place that he envisioned for us always to be and he says I'm gonna do that through my servant Abraham and his children so the children of Abraham that is Israel become the means through which the vehicle through which God is going to bless the nations so it's God's intention through Israel to draw the world to himself 
He places Israel in the midst of nations that are worshiping idols, in the midst of nations that are consumed by sin, and God desires for Israel to be a city on a hill or a light to the nations. And everything from there goes perfectly, right? Wrong. The Bible keeps going on from Genesis chapter 12, on from when God says to Abraham, I want to use you and your progeny to be a vehicle, a blessing of drawing the world back to myself and back to the intentions that I had for humanity. Israel doesn't do a great job in participating in what God wants to do. What's the problem? Israel is just as sinful as the nations that is surrounding it. They themselves, Israel itself, needs to be healed from the effects of sin. They too have participated in polluting the world that God made with the intention for it to be good. So again, we see a problem. And yet God once again offers a solution. God moves to redeem humanity. God still moves with the intention, the loving intention, to bring us back to himself and to bring the world that he created back to the intention in, in which he created it for, all the goodness that he desired for to, to, to be in it. So what's the solution? God promises to heal all of broken humanity in the world that we have helped to drive in the opposite direction of God's intent for it. So this is what God means when he says in Isaiah 65, or when he gives the promise in Isaiah 65, that he is going to create a new heavens and a new earth, that the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And this is the expectation of many first century Jewish people. By the time we get to Jesus' day, they're looking for God to fulfill this promise that he's made in Isaiah 65 and other places in scripture. So this is the expectation of first century Jewish people that Jesus um, encounters. This is the Lord's context. They are expecting that God was going to renew the world and renew humanity. But the question was how? How exactly was God going to pull this off? This was what they were wondering. And the answer that the Old Testament gives to the how God is going to fulfill this promise is twofold. The Old Testament gives this twofold answer. On the one hand, it says that God was going to do this through a person that he would anoint. The meaning of Messiah or Mashiach in Hebrew, Messiah means anointed one. So God says on the one hand that he's going to fulfill his promise through an anointed person, through someone that he anoints to do this work. And then on the other hand, the Old Testament also gives the answer that God himself is going to come and fulfill his promises. So you see the twofold nature of the answer that the Old Testament gives. And you can understand why the people are asking and are still having questions about the how. And where you see this twofold answer the clearest is in Isaiah. Going back to our friend Isaiah the prophet. In Isaiah 42 through 53, this is a portion of scripture that is called the servant songs. And in this particular portion of scripture, in this portion of Isaiah's writings, we see these twofold, this twofold answer come together. That God does indeed say he's going to do it through an anointed person, and God does indeed say that he's going to come and do it himself. And that's how the new how the Old Testament ends. It ends on this twofold cliffhanger with God promising to renew all things, but through which one? An anointed person or through 
himself? And the answer that the New Testament gives is yes. It's both. The New Testament is saying that God doesn't just give this answer in the Old Testament to be confusing, but to say how he's going to do it. So here enters Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One. Christ, this is important to know, Christ being translated, or Christ, the word Christ is a translation of the Hebrew Bible's title or word Mashiach, and it comes into the Greek as Christos and into the English as Christ. So when we are seeing Jesus Christ, we are not seeing Jesus' last name, but we are seeing Jesus, the Anointed One. It's a recognition of his title, of his Messiahship, of Jesus claiming to be the one indeed that was going to fulfill the promise of Isaiah 65, to renew all things and to fulfill the promise of Isaiah 42 through 53 to be the anointed one and God himself and to be God himself present to fulfill his promises. Alrighty, so we're still on this ride to see how the resurrection of Christ is connected to God's promise to renew all things. What we've seen so far is two things. One, we've seen thus far God's promise to renew the world and to renew humanity. And we've seen the why behind God's promise. We've seen God looking down at the world in the state that it's in, and we have seen the why behind God's gracious promise to us. And number two, what we've seen is in the Old Testament, we had the promise, but the question was how. The people had the question of how exactly was God going to fulfill this promise. And the Old Testament promises that God would do it, one, he would renew all things through the Messiah, and it also says that two, that he would renew all things by coming himself to do the task. All right, so moving on. Number three, now Jesus enters the picture and says he is the one that's promised to bring the, the promise that God has given to fulfillment, that he is the Messiah, that he is Yahweh in the flesh come to fulfill the promise. And so when Jesus steps into the first century world of, of Judaism, when he, sets, when he steps into first century world of Judea, we see that Jesus comes and he claims to be the Messiah. But he's not the only one, he's not the only Jewish man that shows up in the first century and says, hey, I'm the promised Messiah. When we look through the pages of history, there are quite a few there, there's a lot, actually, that say that they are the promised Messiah. The New Testament even speaks about this in one place. We see in Acts chapter 5, um, Gamaliel mentions one of the failed messiahs. Another one that we see um, just, I think, uh, a couple years, a couple decades after Jesus, is this man named Simon bar -Kosiba. And he also claims to be the Jewish Messiah. Now he's important in history, Simon by Kosiba, or by Kokba, as some people call him, because he had the most support of the Jews within the land of Judea. Now what all of these messianic claimants had in common, all of these guys who said that I'm the Messiah that was promised. What they had in common is that they all died and that none of them had any evidence of God using them to bring about the new heavens and the new earth. They had no evidence of the renewal of all things being started through their work. And so because of that, the people who followed them and who initially said, okay, if you're the Messiah, I'm going to believe you, I'm going to ride with you on this. After they died, their followings ceased. 
So Jesus enters this context where there are many stepping up and saying, I am the one, I am the Messiah, I am he who was promised. But Jesus enters this context differently. As Jesus is preaching, he makes some claims. He claims to be the Messiah, the anointed one that God will use to usher in the new heavens and the new earth, the one who will renew humanity. He claims to be Yahweh in the flesh, the one who is going to bring the promises of the Old Testament to fulfillment. Now what separates Jesus from these other messianic claimers is that when Jesus makes the claim to be the Messiah, his claim is actually validated. Jesus validates his claim to be the Messiah through his resurrection. What separates Jesus from all of the other messianic claimants is that as he's going about doing good works and he says that the result of him doing these good works is that he's going to be murdered, that he's going to be crucified, or as James Cone puts it, lynched. He says that what's going to validate his claim because his work is going to lead to his death, what's going to validate his claim is that he's going to rise from the dead. And God isn't going to raise a liar. So if he's telling the truth, then he should rise from the dead just as he said he would. That's what Jesus stakes his messianic claim on. He says many, he acknowledges that many will come and say that they are the Messiah. But what sets him apart, what backs up his claim is that he is going to be raised from the dead and that God ain't going to raise no liar. So if I'm telling the truth, then what I say will happen should happen. And he did rise from the grave. And so what does this mean? The resurrection of Christ is God showing us the beginning of the restoration or the resurrection of his creation. Those of us who are in Christ, even now, are beginning to experience God's renewal of humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But there will come a day when the renewal will reach its climax, when we ourselves will receive a resurrection like Christ, where we are fully freed from all corruption, all that pollutes God's intentions for his good world, all that causes us to participate in polluting God's intention for his good world, i.e. our sinful nature. And there will be a day when God will renew the whole of his creation, the world that he created, and make it the way that he intended for it to be. So what the resurrection of Christ means is that when Jesus rises from the grave, it's, it's the sign that validates all that he said, all that he claimed to be is true. And it singles him out for all of history to be the one through whom God promises, God's promises will be fulfilled. That is not any other person that steps up and says that they are the Messiah, but it's only through the one whose claims are validated through his own resurrection. And as Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the one through whom the promises will come to pass. His resurrection is a picture of the resurrection we ourselves will receive through him. And it becomes a picture of the resurrection that God will give his world, a resurrection to the purpose that he originally had for it. The resurrection singles Jesus out as the one who will bring complete fulfillment to renew humanity in the way that we need to be renewed. And it singles Jesus out as the only one who will bring about the new heavens and the new earth. And that's good news when we're looking at the world that we're living in with all of its corruption, all of its violence. It's good news that God has said, I'm looking at this 
and I'm coming to solve the problem. So our job in this present moment is to spread this good news. This is a part of what the Great Commission is about. Our job is to tell people that through Christ, God has been and will be faithful to his promises to renew us as humanity and to renew his world. And that if they want to be a part of God's renewed world, then they need to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Lord will begin that work of renewing in them even right now through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that one day that renewal for them is going to reach its climax through a resurrection like Christ for us. We need to tell them that if they want to be a part of what God is doing in renewing his world and renewing his people, then to submit to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. Or if they want to be on the bad side of God cleansing his world of evil, then stay in your sins. But either way, God has promised, as Isaiah 65 says, that he is going to bring about the new heavens and the new earth, and that he is going to bring humanity back to its original intention, the goodness that he has for his human creatures, and that God is going to bring his world to the purpose for which he created it. If you want to be a part of that, then you need to follow the one who has been singled out through the resurrection to be the one and only to bring about the resurrection for you and me and for the world as a whole. So when we bring this full circle, we can see why these words were so encouraging to the, to the Thessalonians why Paul would write to them about the resurrection as a congregation that was mourning and in sorrow and experiencing persecution, experiencing the darkest aspect of the world, seeing their brothers and sisters be killed, Paul encourages them by letting them know that you need to remember that what is promised, that which is promised in and through Christ Jesus that the way things are is not the way that they are going to be, that God is going to heal his world and that God is going to heal his people. So continue to stand strong, proclaim the message, invite people even now to step into God's promise to renew us through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Stand strong, he tells this church. Remember, remember, what is coming. These words to the Thessalonians are God's words to us. And as the creeds say, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us proclaim this good news. And when we find ourselves in, in times where we're looking at the world and we feel discouraged by what we see and that that's that's something that we all go through from time to time we can look at everything that's happening in the world from the shootings that or the violence that has ticked up in our recent times in the bronx this pandemic that seems as though it never wants to end wars and rumors of wars around the world, personal sufferings. When Paul is looking at all of this, his words to us is to remember that the way things are right now is not the way that they are going to be. That God sees the suffering that we experience and the suffering that is experienced in his world. And he has indeed promised to fix it, to heal it. And we are here to proclaim this message as we proclaim the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll see you next time, beloved.